Are we ready to roll, man? Are we good? All right, man, good to see y'all. Good to see everybody after a lunch. Man, I promised, I think I made too many promises. I told you I'm not going to bore you, so I, I'm going to try to hold on to that, that promise for sure. Man, thank you all so much for coming today. I know this is right after lunch. We're going to try to keep this as engaging as possible. My name is Mike French, and we're going to tell you a little bit about uh, project-based learning. And This is for K through 12, so no matter what grade you teach, even college level, man, you can adapt some of these projects and things. So we hope that you come out of here with some, uh, with some knowledge about something you can bring back to your classroom. So uh, this is my principal, Mr. Lynn Garner. I'm going to let him say whatever he's going to say here. And oh, I, no matter what you see today, I think we all know what the teacher makes all these things happen. What you saw today at the beginning of the classroom is what he does every single day. <laughs> every kid that comes in his room, that's the excitement they come into the classroom. So it doesn't matter what, what we have going on. You bring that energy it's contagious with them. And they can't wait to be in his classroom. So, like he said, a lot of these things are K to 12. Some of these projects we've even gotten from universities, um, engineering departments, things like that. So, he's an amazing teacher. You're, you're right. He's not, you're not going to be bored. I'm going to get out of his way and let him do his thing. But, um, great teacher. Hopefully, you'll get something out. All right, so like I said, STEM, project-based learning for everyone. So I teach middle school, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. I'm in, uh, we're in northwest Tennessee, uh, New Bern, Tennessee. It's Dyer County. We're about three hours from Nashville. Uh, but, man, we were recently uh, awarded the STEM designation last year. So a lot of great things happening at our school. We're very proud of, but always trying to get better, for sure, um, just as, as we all are. But what I want to take you through today before we click play on the video is these are, man, it's, it's 12 major projects that I do in my classroom. And so I just want you to look at these projects. It's kind of like from beginning to end, just kind of some steps to take on some of these projects. And all I want you to do is just see, man, can I use this in my elementary classroom? Can I use this in my middle school? Can I use this in my, my high school classroom? So again, middle school. So um, a lot of the projects you're going to see, I look at science standards, math standards. We'll cover all of that in maybe like Q&A at the end or something like that if you have specific questions. But, man, I want you to ask some questions. Uh, I'm going to try not to put you to sleep. I'm going to move around a lot. So if I go up and down the aisle, just, just don't trip me. So uh, we'll do the best we can. Um, Brandon, I think we're ready, dude. All right, so one thing that I do in my classroom that um, I just want to, I want to get our students acclimated to the engineering design process, right? So the best way to do that is just to, I have it painted on the back room of my classroom. Um, it's very important, and I think everybody has different steps, but identify a problem or need, design a solution, test your design, evaluate your results. And man, we just repeat that process over and over, not just in STEM, but that's a life skill, right? That's just like, you try to be better today than you were yesterday. And so it's painted in the back, back of my classroom. But one project that we do, and I start this out with every sixth grader, is balloon jousting. Very simplified uh, project Very here, but it's balloons. Right now, you can kind of just see, they got to figure out where to put the straw one, on the balloon. Two, three, fight! And right now, they're just balloon which one, wrestling, which right? One, they're just trying to like tug one, of war going back and one? forth, which balloon has the most momentum. And then we add an element of danger. So you can see there are skewers added to the end of these balloons, right? So we, now your, your objective is to blow up your opponent. It's balloon, right? Blow up your opponent's balloon. So uh, we do that through some balloon jousting here. So you'll see in the video. Hey, one, students, two, three, like. fight. Oh! oh! Victory for Boo. We'll see if we can get us a winner here. One, two, three, fight. Oh! Nice job. That was awesome. Two, three, fight. And sometimes they'll get lucky. Both of them will blow up. Wow. <laughs> But, man, we move from that, and we go into a seventh grade project called kayaks. And so kayaks, again, the main objective of this is to teach water displacement and buoyancy. And basically that anything can float. How do aircraft carriers made of steel, how do they flow, right? It's all about water displacement. So we start off, again, with some simple vocab, things like that. But I give them a sheet of aluminum foil, and they design it however they want oh, to displace the most right amount there. of weight. And we test these dudes in a little bucket of water and golf balls. How many golf balls can your boat hold. So then we advance that to phase two. And these are our cardboard um, prototypes. So this is going to be kind of what the main project is going to look like. We just got a smaller version of it right here. So it's same objective. How many golf balls can you hold just for them to see that cardboard is not a buoyant material. So they're going to have to figure out how to fold this dude 
and, and use some hot glue to make it float. Then we advance to the big ones here. So these are our full-size kayaks. The objective is we load them with 400 pounds, and we take them to our golf course pond, and we go across 90 yards of water. So here we are on the walkover. Uh, we have the Flamingo, the SS Pencil, which is pretty sharp, by the way. That's, <laughs> y'all are, are good after lunch. Y'all got that dad joke. Um, man, we got the penguin. We got uh, the American flag. We have several designs. Of course, when you give the kids an opportunity to design their own boat, they're going to come up with some pretty creative ideas. Uh, we, have, we have this one here, the, uh, the flamingo, uh, the swan. But one that we can't forget, of course, is the Titanic, <laughs> which did not recreate history, by the way. It made it all the way across. So you can see the pond that we put these dudes in. I load them with 400 pounds of sandbags, and then they have to pull their own boat gotta across go, the go. water. It's taking oh. on water. You got to go. Hey, you there? And you can hear all of our Newbern folks saying, go, go, you go. Watch this. 400 pounds. The very first year we did this project, we put people in them, like actual hats. For, uh, not kids, not kids. We don't have that good of insurance. But I had some, some kayaking friends, and they, they kayaked them across. Uh, but it's been too cold. So here's some just some group pictures, because we know parents love group pictures for sure. So we take a lot of pictures. But now we're going to move to another project. This is catapults. Man, this is elementary, middle, high school, college, whatever. So with catapults, the main, the kind of the first prototype that we make are cardboard catapults, right? So they're just powered by a rubber band, a wooden dowel, just some simple materials so kids can mess up. That, like, we encourage that, right? So if kids mess up, then that's how they learn. They learn what not to do on the next try. So we test these dudes. Their objective, nice. she gets pretty excited on this nice. one, and dabs, <laughs> bringing, it, bringing it back to 2019. Um, so our objective here is can you launch an aluminum foil ball, 25 feet, hit a target, and so that's what they're doing. And then we have STEM nights, right? So they get to test these in STEM night. Then we advance to level two. Now, to level two is a little bit more advanced. We learn the trajectory formula for physics, which is a college-level formula. Uh, we just expose it to them. But now they move to the wooden catapults. The wooden catapults, again, are made out of, you can see right here on the screen, some boards, a bolt. We power it with a bungee cord. So, man, a lot of kinetic energy, vocab, a lot of potential energy, trajectory. you got a lot of cool stuff that you can teach with this. And then we show them off at our STEM night. So in this particular STEM night, Man, for our little town of Newbury, we had about 600 people, which is amazing. But you can see we have two competitions, accuracy, where they're trying to hit targets at different distances, and then long distance. Of course, long distance is kind of the show dog. Everybody wants to see how far we can launch a tennis ball, and the students love that. But this is what our STEM nights kind of look like. So here are some students testing. Yeah, one, two, three, five. Trying to hit targets. We keep a big, giant scoreboard, and man, the, the crowd gets into it. It's pretty cool. And these are my sixth graders. And then, of course, you know, we have trophies, little prizes and things, just some incentives uh, for them to, have the, to build the best catapult. So then we move on from catapults into something called little bits. Now, if you've never seen little bits before, oh, my goodness, it's worth the investment, right? So electricity is a science standard that sixth grade has, right? So this is a safe way to teach electricity because these are magnetic little um, circuits that you can put together. They snap together, and, man, you can create a plethora of things with little bits. So little bits you can create, and you'll see a few little items here of things that you can create that my students have created. Uh, but you can make little um, switchboards. You can make uh, robots. You can make just a plethora of things. So it's cool because you get to see what the student's imagination can create. So little drawing robots. Um, that's kind of like a little caterpillar robot. It'd be perfect for the hungry caterpillar in elementary school. This student right here designed a little bit's castle and a little bit's robot. She's controlling the robot with her phone. The castle steps have oh, pressure works. sensors, so you can get as advanced as awesome. putting pressure sensors, motion detectors, all of these cool things on your with your little bit's kit. This. The theme for this particular year was Disney, awesome. so this, this kiddo came up with a little bit's robot named Wally, obviously. Y'all seen Wally? No. She's controlling this dude with her phone, yep. and the little bits, of course, are the electronic components. But the one that the kids love the most is this is from Toy Story. So this is the uh, model of the room. It's an automatic bed maker. So the kids are like, if you don't want to make your bed, come see us in Northview because we'll teach you how to make one of these. So they power all of that with little bits. Then we advance on to Bridges. So Bridges is my seventh grade project, and my seventh graders love, love, love this project 
because there's so many things you can do with it. So we always start off with your basic vocab. You know, it's kind of the boring stuff that students really don't like, but it kind of gives them an idea of some of the things that they can do and, and understand how bridges are made. So we, we teach trust bridges because we're really close to the Mississippi River where we are. So, of course, that's a trust bridge. So we start off with simple supplies that are very inexpensive, like pipe cleaners and straws, right? So you can build, you know, a variety of bridges. Students kind of understand that concept. And then we move on to the architectural design. So these are scale drawings. So I do teach a little bit of architecture in there just so they can kind of get an idea of what a scale drawing is. And so you can kind of see, these are just some, some student samples that we've done. So they have to make their bridge. Everyone makes the same size and length. They can make it however they want to. And then we use this wood called balsa wood, which most of you have probably heard of. Very lightweight wood that is not intended to hold a lot of weight. So we use balsa wood, and they start designing their own bridges. So you can see of just a variety. And, of course, they name, they put some really cool names on their, on their bridges, uh, the truss bridge. But you can see lots of different designs of, 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 a, of a truss bridge. And then we test these dudes. So here's how we test them. I tie a five-gallon bucket to a stick that goes across the road of the bridge. And so this bucket is dangling. Oh, they fill it, it with sand until it snaps. When the bridge snaps, then we weigh the bucket of sand, right? So we, the, the objective oh, wow. is can you make the lightest weight bridge no with the most amount of bands? Now, this one is trying to buckle. You can see, man, they're loading this dude design. down. That looks interesting. And as my kids will say, this project kind of kills and spills. Oh, oh my God! God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, we have but this bridge right here was the winning bridge. It weighed 2.9 ounces, held 39 pounds of sand. So it's crazy, right? So it's called the uh, uh, the featherweight, and it's proper, oh, properly there made it goes. for okay. sure. All right, now give them a round of applause. So they love the testing, man. They love all of that. But then we take them on a field trip to the Mississippi River Bridge, which is literally in our backyard. It's about 15 miles away from us. So we take them there. We take an engineer with us, and we go under the bridge, which is pretty terrifying. The bus ride home was, was, uh, was much more interesting now that we knew that kind of what held up the bridge for sure. But, uh, man, it's just real-world application. It's something we did in the classroom, so they can kind of see how real bridges are made. All right, so let me talk to you about our presentation academy. So we felt like whenever we started STEM, if kids are going to make some really cool projects, they need to know how to explain how they made those projects, right, to people. So we developed Presentation Academy. So Presentation Academy just allows students to develop some of those soft skills that phones have kind of killed. Firm handshake, eye contact, being engaging with your audience, things like that. So we teach that through students showing off some of their STEM projects. We start with baby steps and do kind of like class presentations. And then my eighth graders move up and they make their own presentations and, of course, present those to the class. So you can see different, uh, different slides here of my, of my students that have kind of created their own little Google slideshow here and present that. And we go to a lot of places. We have STEM night, and that gives kids, when we have STEM night, and this is another picture of one, it gives kids an opportunity who are super shy to get out there and demonstrate their product that they made, their project, and still be in front of an audience to kind of break some of that fear. And then once we go, and I'll get to the hovercrafts in a minute, once we have STEM night, now they're a little bit more confident to be in front of people to explain their projects. Our STEM nights are really good opportunities for our students who are a little timid. Uh, we fly Dude Perfect airplanes. We fight robots. We do a lot of cool things, and I'll explain some of those um, in some later projects here. Uh, but with, with this, they have an opportunity to kind of display and show off some of the cool things that they have. So people are walking all around. So parents might come up and say, hey, what is this project? And it gives them a, just a little taste of presenting so they can feel a little bit confident about their, their product that they've made. So we make presentations all over. So our local Rotary Clubs, um, we bring students to do all of the presenting. Um, that was our very first presentation, and I'll explain that in the Q&A part. We had five students, and now we've grown to about 90 students are in presentation that volunteer their time before school to come in and learn how to be better speakers, more engaging speakers. So we make presentations. This is one at Dyersburg State Community College down the, down the road from us. Well, our, our students actually um, taught the teachers how to, make, how to make catapults for their classroom. So we try to put our students out there as much as possible because we know that being a confident and an engaging speaker is going to go, it's going to pay dividends tremendously in the future. We speak, man, we've spoken to state representatives. We've spoken to business leaders. 
We had this past year, I think, about 14 school systems that came to our school to see our STEM lab and things. So our students get up and do the presentation. So it's kind of cool to see them. Um, we were awarded, of course, a $5,000 TVA check the past three years um, to, to fund some different things for STEM. So every time we have visitors in the building, man, I get the kids up and they present. They kind of present what we're going to do. They present our program. They do the tours. We have this thing called Shark Tank, just like the television show Shark Tank. So my presentation kids compete, and they develop a new product, like totally new that you've never heard of, and then they have to develop a slideshow, and then they present it, and they're competing, and they're, of course this is in front of a crowd of, of adults, they compete in a Shark Tank competition. We also get to partner with some cool places like Union University. Um, we go to different college campuses, and we speak to their education and engineering students about some of our projects. Again, all of this just builds confidence for our students, right? So we want them to be uh, engaging speakers. So while we get to go on some of these cool tours, you know, we get to take a tour of their campus and get some free food, which the kids love. All of those things. Oh, I love it too. But um, we get to go. This is University of Tennessee at Martin. Um, it's in northwest Tennessee. And so, uh, again, we're speaking to their college uh, education students, uh, their engineering students. So, man, we just kind of, we go all over the place. I think coming up is our, we've been invited to the Tennessee Science Conference the past three years. We've presented in Murfreesboro. We bring kids, right? So the kids are kind of the, kind of the show. And so, um, man, we're very fortunate to go across the state. Uh, but even recently, we've gone to the National Science Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, and our kids presented, right? So our kids have presented literally outside of the state um, and inside of the state. And, of course, we take them to fun places like Bucky's and, you know, all that. So last year when we became a STEM-designated school, our students also presented here last year. And I'm going to get to why they're not here today. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so this was the, the TCN Summit last year. I mean, our kids just knocked it out of the park. Makes me so, I'm like a proud papa. I'm like the guy in the back taking photos constantly and tears in my eyes. You know, I'm so proud of them. They're, uh, man, they're just a great group. We have this place called Discovery Park. It's a cool museum that's outside of our area. Um, and so we take kids there. We've been invited to speak to all of their employees at Discovery Park. And we kind of tell them about our STEM program. It's just a way to get the word out about STEM. And what, because we're in rural West Tennessee, y'all. And there's a lot of, most people, do, they don't really realize what STEM is. Um, so you saw our principal, Mr. Garner, going down the slide. So he got some enjoyment out of that as well. Let's jump over to robots real fast. So, of course, robots are kind of a big thing now in STEM. In all of your classrooms, probably, you're starting to develop some robot things. We start off with, uh, again, using simple supplies. I want them to learn the engineering design process. So we use minimal supplies and make these hydraulic robots. Very simplified cardboard, medicine syringe, and some little tubing. We use water to power the hydraulics. But the objective of this is to create a robot that can pick up a can of soda pick it up, rotate it 45 degrees, and set it back down over the other side of the wall. And you see a student here doing that. Hard to know which syringe. Oh, that's perfect. And then we partner up with some local manufacturers, SRG and NSK. Uh, they're manufacturers of different automobile parts, and NSK uh, actually makes steering columns for a lot of the cars that you and I drive. So uh, when, they get to, when, when they go to these manufacturers, of course, they show off some of their products that they made in Today class. So of course, these robots, you get that. to see, oh, picking up some Germex bottles. We're demonstrating the, this for their engineers. And then their engineers are like, well, let me show you our robots, right? So then these are like $1 million robots, but basically the same concept, right? So it's just a, just a different, you know, obviously a different size, uh, but they get to see what robots actually do in the real world, which is really cool. It's kind of eye-opening for the students. And then we advance on to our fighting robots. So these are VEX IQ robots. Some of you may be familiar with those. So we build these. Of course, they're made out of plastic. It's kind of like a kit, but you have about 15 to 20 different robot styles you can make. And of course, they have to program it and code it. There's lots of options for this. But this is kind of the arena that they battle in. So they get a lot of enjoyment about the, uh, with making the robots. So different games each year. And so this particular one, they have to stack these little towers and score points. So you're competing against other teams. And of course, STEM night, we bring out our robots. Um, one of our robots even brought popcorn around to all of the guests. It was pretty cool. Uh, but you kind of see the battle arena. If you're not familiar with VEX robots, they have robots from elementary all the way up to high school. Then we move on to our prosthetic hands. So we partner with a, with a mission group called Enable, Enabling the Future. 
And so within Able, we 3D print prosthetic hands. We ship them to Enable. They distribute them to um, underprivileged children around the world. So it's a cool mission project for our eighth graders to leave school with. And so, of course, we start off with research. We, we kind of see how the function of the hand operates. We use simple supplies because we want them to mess up so they can understand what not to do, right? That's the engineering design process. So we want them to mess up. So we use simple supplies. And you can kind of see some products here of our prototypes. But then we start 3D printing these dudes. And it takes 15 hours to 3D print one prosthetic hand. So once we start the assembly process, you can kind of see these students are at different stages. So it has fingers. It, this is a wrist-activated prosthetic. So it's intended for, for kiddos who still have mobility in their wrist, but they may be missing fingers. And so the design, you can see we put finger grips on them for, you know, to kind of be able to grip things, um, test the dexterity. We have Velcro, some padding on the inside, and we test these dudes a lot. So the design we have is called the Raptor, and you'll see actually a kiddo wearing um, this design. And so, of course, you know, with everything, we want to test to make sure it works before we ship these out to enable because we don't want them to ship out one of our prosthetic hands and it doesn't work. So we test them on things that we think a kiddo might pick up in, real, in the real world, right, like a cup, plush toy, of course, a cell phone because every kid has a cell phone these days, um, fruit, just different things, tissue, just to test the dexterity of, of the product. And then we test the strength of it as well. So larger items like our Choctaw Spirit Stick, that's our school uh, Pepper Alley Spirit Stick, large bottles of Germex, just to see kind of what the limit is. And the, again, these are designed for toddlers ages 2 to 5, somewhere in there, 2 to 4. And then, of course, we ring the St. Jude Cowbell just to, just to test it out. But, man, they're full functioning. Uh, we, can, we can make a prosthetic for about 30 bucks, so it's pretty cool. Then we move on to the hovercrafts. This is another cool project. So our hovercrafts, um, it's kind of like air hockey, but in reverse, right? You ever play air hockey and the air blows the little uh, hockey puck up, up and up a little bit and you can hit it and it slides pretty easily? It's the exact same thing, but these are student-driven hovercrafts or now teacher-driven hovercrafts because our teachers love them more than the students. But we start off with a couple of sheets of plywood, um, just a leaf tarp, just some simple things that you can get from your local hardware store. And we've developed partnerships with Lowe's in our community. Uh, Lowe's has helped donate a lot of things for us in, in our community. And so we're, we're very fortunate for their partnership. But, man, we, we put a little uh, plastic chair on top, just some uh, pool noodles around for padding. Students design whatever they want, whatever designs. You can see St. Jude. There's Wakanda. We've got Spider-Man. So they just, Terrence the Angry Bird. <laughs> we have a variety of things that they uh, want to design. And then our students test them. So this is our very, very, very first test. I was a little nervous, but it did. It picked up a student off the floor. And then we do some cool stuff around school, like hovercraft bowling. Good job. Good job. It's pretty awesome. It's powered by a leaf blower, a battery-powered leaf blower. Hey, you can kind of see. And our teachers love the hovercrafts more than the students do. Um, and, of course, we bring them to STEM night and we compete with them. We even brought them to Union University and let some of their engineering students test them out. They absolutely love them at, at the college level. Of course, Union's my alma mater. Um, but, man, we uh, took them there. This is their engineering professor. He, he, like, he, for real, wanted to take that home. He was like, I really want to take this one home. And we were like, can't let that happen. My students would cry. But, man, he loved it. And even Miss Mathis, one of their educa educator educating professors uh, loved it too man it was awesome uh, commissioner schwinn came to my classroom came to our school to visit and uh, we put her on one of the hovercrafts too last year or this past year but here's one of our teachers man taking a joy ride down the hallway i told you teachers love them more than anybody we've tested them to lift 360 pounds off the ground so um, that's the max that we've tested anyways you may be able to go a little higher than that but 360 but our teachers love them um, and then we move on to these cars. So with cars, uh, we start off again with very simplified versions. So we make Pinewood Derby cars at the very beginning. So if you know of a Boy Scout or something like that, you may have seen uh, Pinewood Derby cars. So we just kind of learn the basic functions of, of real world cars, um, some of the safety things, and then they design their own Pinewood Derby car. Now the objective of this is first to develop the most speed that you can get. So we race, race these down this ready, track. Go. It is an infrared timer at the end. Tells them to the thousandth of a second. And we, we actually stole this idea from the University of Florida. 
So they were using this at the college level. So once we develop speed and students can... So we have Ling Ling, the car here. <laughs> then we crash test All right, them. we're going to see if Ling Ling can survive the uh, brick brick wall down there. Ready? One, two, three, go. Oh! All right, so we yeah. slam them into a brick wall. It has a raw egg on the inside. Oh, eggs in the floor. It was a messy day. Way to go, Ling Ling. But it was fun. The kids will never forget that, right? So we learned about crash tests, safety features on cars, and then, of course, we show them off at our STEM night. We have different competitions with our cars. But it doesn't end here, right? So we want to advance that as much as we can. So we have kids building their own soapbox derby car that they drive. So they'll drive their own car. They'll build their own car, design their own car. They'll drive their own car. So it's very yeah. simplified. Yeah. Go, Kate. Go, Kate. You're on video. Design. No pressure. It's got a pivot system in the front. You can kind of see right here our students starting to put the frame together. Steering system there. With their you can kind of see they put their feet up there, and it's a little pivot system. And then they they, they build the body of the car. So again, this year's, this particular year, um, the theme was superhero. So you see a lot of superhero designs on this spray painting thing. So they make them look like Jeeps or cars or whatever they want them to look like. All right, so I'm almost and completed. Then soapbox here's some cars. of the finished products. Captain America. Captain America. You got Batman. Batman, Man, they really put some thought into, into the Superman design of these. Cars coming together good. And what you're going to see here in just a second is some of them take it a little, a little further than others. So they put stadium seats on the inside, Bluetooth speakers, LED lights. I mean, they're going to, they're going to let this dude uh, look good for sure. So that's kind of our first little test, but you can kind of see some of them don't have the top on them yet. And then we advance our eighth graders on past the cars. Then we go to drones. So drones are... Uh, again, we're rural West Tennessee. Drones are becoming a huge part of technology in the future uh, for STEM, for sure, STEM education. So we have these cool drones. Of course, we teach how drones are used in the military. Um, we you know, deliver Amazon packages, things like that. And then we, we ordered these drones through a place called Holy Stone. Uh, they're a great drone company, very simplistic. But students have to program, and that's where they learn a little bit about the programming functions of remote control systems and how my remote doesn't operate your drone, and et cetera. So they have to program it, and then we, we take it outside to test. Now, our drones have a camera system on them, um, Good. and they'll fly about a quarter of a yeah. mile away. But y'all, right, I mean, this, it's, it does scare me when we, when we fly drones because there's four propellers spinning. Uh, but again, safety features, teaching all of that is critical, and I think y'all know that. Good. But we start off in baby steps. So the very first week, we're like Good. five Keep feet going. off the ground. Let's go 20 feet and let's Keep land going. that dude. So we just kind of build Keep up to the, to the big going. stuff. We have a McDonald's about a quarter Come of on. a mile away, as, a, as, as Tennesseans would yep. say, as a crow <laughs> flies, right? A straight, a straight shot. These will good. actually fly to McDonald's and back. Awesome. We've never picked up a Happy Meal, though. We need to learn how down. to do that. There but you can see, they get a little higher and higher until eventually we're about 100 feet into the air. Great job. So it, it takes a long time to build up to that level, but 100 feet into the air, and that way we can kind of see kind of what's around. Now, this is behind our school. Students have to fly their drone to count how many cows are behind our school. <laughs> Again, we're rural West Tennessee here, so um, we're not counting people. We're counting cows. So uh, this is the front of our school. Again, just to kind of get some familiarity with them. Uh, one of our snow days, I took the drone up just because just I wanted to have fun with it. Uh, but I flew it on top of our school. But, man, we're starting to teach students that you can use these to diagnose problems with a heating system on top of the roof. You don't have to send somebody up on a ladder to diagnose it. We could kind of fly the drone and get it close. If there's something that's not functioning right, we can kind of diagnose that um, and hopefully not uh, or hopefully present, prevent someone from, from falling off a ladder. This is our house system that we have. This is one of our open houses that we've had. Um, of course, I fly the drone over and just kind of show some different things. And this is our, I think this is our final project, is underwater drones. So we go from flying drones to underwater drones. Now, these underwater drones uh, we got from a company called Chasing Dory. I, got, I bought it with the TVA STEM grant money that uh, many of you have probably uh, gotten before. So these drones are equipped with a 4K camera system. LED lights, they go 49 feet underwater, and you control it through an app on your phone. So the students control everything about this drone just with their phone. So it's pretty cool. So there's a buoy that floats on top of the surface 
Because once an item is underwater, you lose signal, right? You're not going to get a Wi-Fi signal in any way, shape, or form. So the buoy actually provides the signal to the student's phone. And, of course, that little tether is really there for safety. So in case it gets tangled up in, inside some shrubbery or something under, underwater, uh, uh, we can pull that dude back out. So in class, we just kind of tested them, got them acclimated to adapting to their, you know, connecting to their phone. And then we took them to a, a swimming pool that's really close to our school just to see... How do these things function in, in kind of a, a setting where we can actually see, the, see through the water? And so you're going to see here in just a second, our students are connecting these, but you're going to see what the drone sees underwater to show you how clear the camera systems are on this. So we had about 10 drones in, in the pool at the same time, just kind of venturing around. So should be coming right up. All right, so there's the clarity of the, of the camera system, man. Um, Pretty awesome stuff. So, again, these can be used to teach underwater ecosystems. Um, I mean, we all have waterways around, around our, our schools. Just to teach a variety of things with this for sure, but um, you can have some fun with them too. I had a friend of mine who lost his golf club at the golf course, and he's like, can you take one of those underwater drones and find my golf club? And I really did. I tried. Of course, pond water is a little murky, and it's just like anything else. You get too close to the bottom, um, it's going to kind of stir up some, some silt and things. But, man, what we wanted to do today, and I appreciate you not going to sleep on me. I told you I'd try to keep you awake. What we wanted to do today is just show you guys some things that we do at the middle school. Um, some of it is expensive, some of it's not, but most of it, I hope you saw, most of it is just made with simple materials like cardboard, just some things that you can get, uh, get your hands on pretty easily. And so these are like 12 major projects that we do. Of course, we do a lot more than this, but we just kind of wanted to show you, and we hope that... You guys can see, like, for example, the catapults. If you're an elementary teacher, man, you can take catapults and use popsicle sticks and marshmallows, right? So we do that. Um, you, can, you can get as advanced as the wooden ones launching tennis balls. You can even go bigger than that at the high school, college level. Um, you ever heard of, I think it's called pumpkin chunkin' or something? So um, perfect, perfect thing to do right after Halloween. You know, just to do competitions with them. Uh, there's a variety of things. But we hope, and again, my goal is to make sure you guys just see some ideas, see what's out there, what can we do, what can I do in my own classroom, and bring that back to your school, and then just, let's just make STEM just awesome all across the state. It's kind of the goal, right? So everything we do is for, for our kids. But um, again, I'm Mike French. This is my principal, Mr. Garner. My vice principal, Ms. Lori Evans, could not be here with us today. Uh, but man, here's our contact information. We'd love for you to, uh, to reach out to us. We have several school systems that come to our school um, just to kind of see the STEM that we have, STEM programs that we have, and um, just some cool stuff that we have going on at Northview in little, little New Bern, Tennessee. So we're excited. We're very proud of our school. But man, thank you all so much. And so we want to kind of open this up, I guess, to questions. Now, Mr. Garner's going to be able to answer more of the um, budgeting questions, kind of the things like that, scheduling, uh, kind of those areas. Um, I can talk to you about some of the projects. If you're like, well, where did you get that? Or how did you do that? Man, y'all are educators. Y'all can ask me some questions. It's going to be good. I'll do my best to answer them. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so you know how I recruited y'all to come in here? And I was like, oh, I need to come in here and into this room today. Like, I just do that with businesses. Like, Lowe's has been huge for us. I really do. Um, but we do. Like, of course, I'll write the TVA grant, the STEM grant that TVA offers. Um, but, man, I try to partner. Dyer County, we're about, gosh, our biggest city is Dyersburg. If, you, if you're familiar with West Tennessee, 12,000, 14,000 people, somewhere in there. So we have, a, we have about five or six really big manufacturers. And I just try to partner with them and just – Really just tell them, and this is what we do. Usually my kids will present this whole thing to you. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to bring kids to the TCN conference this year. Um, so that's why you're hearing from me uh, and Mr. Garner. But, um, but man, we just try to partner with as many local manufacturers. People, once they see kind of what our school is pursuing, man, most places are really open to helping you out. You know, like the cardboard for the kayaks. So you can't just use like cardboard box. I guess you could cardboard boxes, but I wanted big sheets of cardboard. So we have a cardboard manufacturer in in uh, about 20 miles from us, 15 miles from us, and they donate 10 foot sheets of cardboard. So it's perfect, right? So we can make mistakes with cardboard. It's very plentiful. Uh, it's easy to get your hands on. And so um, so we just kind of partner with as many. Mike asked for all these. So this is what our sixth and seventh year to do STEM. So 
What I started doing, I learned after about the second year, whatever he gives me, I double the fee. <laughs> and then and then we True. we purchase it. But we're we're fortunate. Our school system has made a commitment, not just all these people, but we we put thousands of dollars in the mm-hmm. school system in STEM. We teach it every day. Ninety percent of my kids have it every single day throughout the year. Um, for extended period of time, the shortest amount of time. Yeah, I don't know if that's We're very fortunate, man. Our school system is just, just awesome. Hey, Molly. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you've heard this before, yeah. So with a lot of projects, of course, we want to make it as real world as possible. So with a lot of our projects, I give students a budget, right? So y'all probably have done that with some other things. So for example, like um, I'll use the catapults again for an example. So I give them $150 of uh, fake money but I sell them items and they can only purchase items for their catapult through my store called French's Construction Supply Store. I have the best prices in town. I always tell them that. It's like, I have best prices in town. So for example, like a foot of duct tape is $5, right? I know, that's, that's a good price. Y'all are supposed to smile at that. Um, I have, uh, gosh, bolts, um, things that they use for pivot points, um, you know, little styrofoam pieces. I sell those at really discounted prices, like $15 for a nail, you know, things like that. So what's cool about that, I'm glad you mentioned that, Molly. What's cool about that is you start to hear conversations from students because you have that one kid, everybody has that one kid that's like, let's buy $150 worth of duct tape and wrap the whole thing up, right? You have that kid, but then you have to think practically, right? Like the other kids in the group are like, dude, we cannot do that. We have to also buy this and this and this. So they really start to think about before they go and spend their $150, they have to think about, how, what do we need to make this dude work? Because everything we do is a competition. So every project, they're competing, and so no one wants to lose, right? So they're like, I want this one to be the best. So that's what's been beneficial, too, is everything. We have STEM nights, and they compete in front of the entire community, and it's really cool. So just about every project um, has a budget in some way, shape, or form, and they have to buy from me. They can't take it to Papaw's Garage, because we all know there's some kids who, like, man, they're loaded with all these extra supplies and that their mama house and some kids don't have that so that's why I make it a fair playing field they have to buy all their supplies from me yeah yeah so we just had our stem I call it a stem day because we looked at our calendar in the month of May and there was lit- literally and y'all are in the same boat there's no night in May that we could do anything So we just had ours last Friday, actually. So whatever the project is that the students are working on, I try to get that to where they're all finishing at about the same time. So I have two sixth grade classes, two seventh grade classes, and two eighth grade classes that take STEM every single day. And so uh, the projects I start, I kind of know about how long they're going to take. And so then when I see the progress, I'll say, I'll get with Mr. Garner and Miss Lori, and I'll say, hey, can we have a STEM night in three weeks, four weeks, something like that. So, of course, they'll always say yes, and so I try to plan that out. So then we send out invitations on our school Facebook page, and then, you know, let, let kids know, you know, in four weeks we have STEM night. So they get ready, they spray paint, they get all the cool decorations and things. Um, and then, so I just kind of develop in my brain what STEM night, what, what I want it to look like. So the accuracy competition, long distance, how do we do all this? So Friday, this past Friday was our STEM day that we had at school. It's the first time I've ever done a STEM night during the day. So it allowed the, the entire school, it was a school assembly, it allowed the entire school to come and watch because not everybody's going to get to come to a STEM night, but when it's a school assembly, everybody can come to that, right? So, and plus they get out of class, so they're, they're pretty cool with that. So, um, so we just had just multiple competitions. So our sixth graders did the accuracy and long distance competition with catapults. Our eighth graders, actually, they just finished the hovercrafts, and you guys saw that. Um, and then our seventh graders raced cars, of course, down the track. We had that set up in the gym. So it's just kind of all set up in the gym in a central location. Um, sometimes in, in years past, we've had display tables where it was kind of like a science fair. So, again, that goes into the presentation academy part where shy sixth graders, it's usually sixth graders, I have stand behind the table, and then they have their, you know, their little trifold board and things, and then parents and, and community folks can come up and say, oh, what do you have right here? And that gives them just a very 
um, informal way to kind of share what their project is. And then they build confidence, and they're like, oh, my gosh, you know, they, they really like my project. And so that just kind of builds as we go through Presentation Academy, and they kind of grow in that area. Did that answer every, everything? Thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sure. Yeah, so to be a STEM designated school, um, we, our entire school has to encompass that. And so uh, with math, you know, they all, they all have PBLs. But for STEM night, I just can't, it's about the projects that we do in my class for STEM. Because I kind of organize that, and it's just kind of my baby that I kind of nurture we there. Act, and we actually have a PBL lab. Yeah. Outfitted with. Box. Microphones don't like you, do they? Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Sorry, you so. So we have a PBL lab where you can bring your English class, whatever. We have toolboxes like you would see in Big Mac. Get them from Lowe's, that roll. But uh, have them stocked with all kinds of stuff. Anybody can go in there. All you have to do is if you start pushing PBLs, a lot of times it's not conducive. They need to be up moving. So we created a PBL lab. Or that, kind of like a science lab, project based. That, that kind of helps. What's cool and what's been great about our school is that, man, our entire school has really embraced STEM. Once they find out, like, oh, my gosh, project-based learning is its actually easier when you put, incorporate a project into an ELA lesson because the kids start to understand the ELA lesson a little bit more because now there's a project tied to it. So when you have just the ELA lesson or a math lesson, you're only going to reach so many kids with that verbally, right, like a, you know, like a lecture type. Uh, learning, but when you incorporate a project into that same learning, they start to see that the, the benefits of that, right? So now you're reaching another group of kids, and so man, our teachers have just been awesome at our school. I'll be honest; they just they really have embraced the entire thing, which was kind of made it easier, I think, for us to go and, and and try out for STEM designation because it has to be everybody in your school it has to. You buy don't in. get to go on the field trip. Oh yeah, yeah. You're not caught up on all your work, so it's yeah. a motivator for the kids. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. So, um, this is all my presentation academy students. We've missed a lot of school this year. Presentation but academy. Yeah, it will. People throw money at us. Be honest. Yeah. Um, I know that sounds crazy, but we have we've probably spent a couple hundred thousand dollars in a small group. Um, but when I put, you didn't get to see our kids today, unfortunately. Most places you would have seen our kids present today. Mr. Brown did a great job, but they were better, honestly. Oh, um, Amen. Amen. And they're a lot prettier and cuter. And all they stuff. are, yeah. Thank and, you. and, man, people just throw, we carry them to con, you know, Rotaries, Kiwanis Club, in front of uh, all the colleges, all these people. Yeah. What do you need? $5,000? $25,000? So yeah. much better than. Oh, yeah, man, I'm pretty boring after about 30 seconds. But the kids are like, very, they're very, I wish, man, I wish they would have been here with us today, but couldn't make that happen. I think he's saying if you're moving this around, it's, it's messing up the signal. Okay. So if you can keep it in one spot. Yes, sir. Woo. Okay, great question. I'm going to try to now. Go back to one if I forget to answer one of them. Okay, so STEM projects, man, um, gosh, depends on the grade level, like sixth grade, probably five major projects throughout the school year, roughly. Seventh grade, you know, it's a little bit less, maybe, you know, they're all about four or five major projects. Now, we do some little things in between to kind of build up to those. Um, now, PBLs, now, for your, like your math teacher, your ELA, social studies, they do, they're required to do one every grading period. So for us, we're on, on a nine-week schedule, so they're required to do one every nine weeks. So that's, that would be four per year uh, for them. Uh, some do more, and some do, you know, some do the four. 
Um, but that's kind of the kind of the makeup of what we have right now. And then, did you? Was there one more? I, I think I did. I get all your. Gotcha. Yes. Yes. So, uh, like sixth grade science standards. I just I really try to look at the science and math standards, and that just really helps. It helps our whole school because if I'm if I'm addressing something in math that I can address in STEM with a project when they get to math and they're like oh I learned about that we made a we made a catapult you know and I learned that math concept or whatever then it helps so I try to the the projects that we do I try to make sure I look at the science and math standards for those to make sure it's grade appropriate for those students that's kind of what I look at Brandon what time do we forgive me man what time do we leave here we're right at time. Is that what you said? We are? Is it 1.30? Y'all help me out here. Okay, good, good. Man, I'm so sorry. If you have more questions, I'll be right here, Mr. Garner and I. But, man, thank you all so much for your time and for not falling asleep on me. It's good. So, thank you.